Hello, um, welcome. I am here with Elizabeth Brown, who is the author of um, The Laughing Policeman. Uh, her new book just came out called The Fractured Few. I am so, so, so excited to talk to you about, I just finished reading The Laughing Policeman. I can't wait to hear about your new book. Um, so thank you so much for joining me, Elizabeth Brown. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And um, good morning. I know there's a big time difference. I did get a bit confused and I thought it was 10 a.m. my time, even though we talked about it. Oh, so, no. Um, I, luckily, I figured it out before it went too far, but time zones, and I've only got one in my country. You'd think I'd be able to um, figure it out. Well, it's so hard because I'm like, how does 10 a.m. sound? And like, like, that could literally be anywhere in the world. I don't think that way. I think in my time zone. So I'm like, everybody else obviously knows I'm in the Eastern time zone. <laughs> Uh, you see, I did a, um, for my new book, I did a live Q&A last night, and when the original invitation went out, I was putting 8.30 p.m. GMT, because I'm yeah. used to Greenwich Mean Time. I didn't realize that it changed with daylight savings, so I was actually putting out the wrong time, so I had to change it to BST. And like I said, we've only got one time zone in this country, so <laughs> it shouldn't be that hard. Oh yeah, I forget. So you you guys change your time for daylight savings at a different time than a lot of other people too. So like sometimes you're five hours ahead, sometimes you're four hours ahead. So it's just it's a big confusing, like sorry, pardon my language, shit show sometimes. So <laughs> like I remember I'm like, okay, just so you, like this is going to happen four and a half hours from now. <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> So it that is. We're not confused about it. <laughs> I mean, if it weren't for mobile phones, I think the the country would probably collapse because we just rely on our phones to wake us up and get us going. And um, you'll tend to find that a lot of the cars in the UK only have the right time on the dashboard for six months of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Do they have the option? Because so I bought a new car recently and it's like oh you can either turn daylight savings on or off so you can just like click a button and it's like boom right time but like nobody ever does that you know so mine is wrong six months of the, out of the year anyway <laughs> possibly on the newer cars um my car is not one of the newer cars so you have to manually set the clock on it so um it doesn't get set i'm i'm happy to wait six months <laughs> It's more fun that way. I feel like, oh my God, it's seven o'clock. Oh no, it's only six o'clock. Okay. <laughs> it is. There's there's either a mild panic that you're an hour late or an hour early, but it's fine. <laughs> and everybody understands, right? <laughs> yeah. Still, pain in the butt. We should all just have the same time, like just across we the should. board. It's just seven o'clock means a different thing to me. Seven o'clock means the middle of the night to me, whereas for you, it's, you know, first thing in the morning. <laughs> yeah <laughs> we should have some sort of santa claus time he manages it yeah no actually that's a great idea i'll i'll t i've i've met santa at the mall before so i'll just ask him because we're good friends <laughs> sounds good <laughs> that's funny um okay so we have a lot to talk about so i um i uh, asked our books of horror book group um to submit a bunch of questions there were a lot of them um so we're going to try to get through them but the first thing that i want to say is i was talking to paulina baker um so she's been helping me with like some of the graphics and her husband's been helping me with an introduction for um, this interview series and we were just chatting about the covers of your book and how much we love them um oh, thank you so yeah like i i shouldn't judge a book by its cover like you know we know that's true like i've read some pretty awesome books with terrible covers but like how do you pick this up and not want to read it like i, oh, I it's it's impossible it's 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 a great cover um and coincidentally it also has a great book inside too so kind of you have both of those things going for you the whole package <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. my designer ben is amazing so he hand paints all of the covers so oh for that God. one um I had the idea of roughly what I wanted I said I want a sort of close-up of the policeman in the formal dress uniform um it's not called that anymore well no it is called that now it wasn't called that when in the time period that the book was set that was just 
the uniform Mm -hmm. and I said I want it to be a little bit tatty I want his face to be bleeding I want him to have piercing blue eyes and he did this sketch and he he added the hand reaching out and um, I saw just the sketch the sort of concept sketch was brilliant and I was like yes I've definitely picked the right person here and when the cover came through I just couldn't stop staring at it so I knew I'd made the right choice I was actually very lucky because when I first started I didn't have a clue about who to go for for covers or editing or anything like that and one of my friends her sister had this brother and this brother did book covers and she said oh you could ask him if you wanted to so I did and that is who I ended up going with so um I owe my friend a big thank you as well. <laughs> oh, you really lucked out because I, I would have the same kind of be like, where the heck do I go for? Like, I have no concept either. I mean, I'm far from ever like publishing a book or anything, but um, that that's a very lucky. I'm like tempted to reach out to this guy too. Like if I ever do write a book, be like, hey, like I saw these things you made. Can you make some for me too? <laughs> he is really lovely as well because um, for the foundling cover, I didn't have a clue and my email to him asking for the cover was I don't have a clue what I want here is the story here are a few key paragraphs could you please come up with something oh and wow that one he did entirely by himself and then obviously the fractured few cover there were actually two two versions of the cover I'm trying to see I don't have it to hand. I could reach and grab it, but I don't want to stand up. That's okay. no. <laughs> but initially, he did a cover for the Fractured Few based on what I had asked for. So he did exactly what I asked for. And I've got a readers group and um, an advanced readers group for this book. And I sent it to them. I said, what do you think? And the general feedback was it was a bit young adult romancy. And I thought, oh. well, that's not the message I want to send so I put it out to, I think I started with the art group put it out to the wider readers group and Mills and Boone came up a lot so I went back to Ben and I said this is the feedback obviously it's entirely my fault because you did exactly what I wanted you to and I still really love the cover but could we give it another go and then I gave him a new idea for it and then he came up with um, the Fractured View cover I love that. I love that so much. Like, how do you, how do you not want to read that? Uh, and again, he um, hand paints all of it in Photoshop. So he's That's very incredible. Talented. That's incredible. Yeah. To be like, oh, you know, like I would be like, I would give like three words and be like, can you do something with this? Like <laughs> hopefully. And then they come back with something just incredible. Um, that, that takes a lot of talent. So I very well worth it. I'm so glad that you have, you know, this resource and I hope he, you know, does the covers for every single one of your books going forward. Me I know too. You. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, oh, that's awesome. Okay. So we do have, we have a lot of questions. Um, so I'm just going to go through them. Um, so like I said, we, we are part of a, the books of horror Facebook group. I just want to give that a shout out to anybody who's watching this. Um, if you are a fan of horror, join this group because there are a lot of indie authors who just have all of this incredible work and they, they all need, um, more eyeballs on them. You know, like I, I would never have, would have picked this book up. Um, if I hadn't been part of this group. So join, join the books of horror group, um, very supportive of indie authors. I'm actually, I'm wearing the t-shirt. You can't see oh. it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yay. Oh, I should have worn mine. I have one too. I should, I actually should just wear them for all of these interviews now that you mention it. <laughs> um, yeah. So shout out to the Indie Brawl, which um, I'm not sure we have a lot of time to talk about it. So basically it's, it's, you know, um, we have 32 indie books and they're, they're all battling it out. So we have to read these 32 books and then we're going to vote for the best one at the end of the day. It's like March Madness, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to see like which one is the best. And the Laughing Policeman is, is one of the contenders for that indie brawl, Um, which I have a feeling it's going to go pretty far if, if I do say so myself. (laughs) Thank you. I hope so. (laughs) I hope so. It's got my vote. I don't know who you're against. I'm against uh, Jay Bauer. So, um, We'll see how it goes because he's another oh. lovely indie author and um, his book's going down very well. 
So I haven't I haven't read his book yet, but honestly, like um, everybody, everybody's amazing. So you have to go buy the books themselves. You can't be like, oh, I just really love Elizabeth. So I'm going to vote for her book. Like you have to read the books. That's my yeah. one tip for everybody. I'm not uh, sure you could even do it by personality because everybody is so lovely that you can't even pick a favorite. I know personality. <laughs> That's what's so great about like this whole group. Like everyone brings up everybody else you know what I mean like you um you read like other people's books and review other people's books and somebody posts another person books and, and you know, you can be like oh I love their book too because it's so easy to be like like don't read their stuff like read my stuff which is yeah, you know, like yeah. a, that seems more normal um but no like everybody builds everyone else up so it's it's amazing all right okay so I'm gonna um start reading these questions um this one is from Reese Bowling. Hey, Elizabeth, what inspired you to become a horror author? Right. So when I decided to write my book, I never officially picked any sort of genre for it. I never thought, right, I am going to start writing horror books. It was just, I am going to write my book. But I think it was always going to end up being dark because that's just what I'm drawn to. When I was a child, I used to write stories and they were all vampires and werewolves and um, in fact when I was in secondary school my teachers at one parents evening brought up the fact that all I would write about was vampires and zombies and all of that and um, could I please expand my um, genre so I think she wanted I don't know something lighter yeah. so it was always going to be answer, you know <laughs> yeah possibly or a a normal book for maybe a 12 year old to <laughs> write at the time so <laughs> it was always going to be dark um but yeah I think even if I didn't explicitly set out to write horror it would have gone that way anyway and it has sort of gone that way anyway so um I don't know if that answers the question but that's my answer <laughs> Yeah. So you were like basically predisposed like this. This is me. This is my passion, even from a young age. So why change that? You know, I mean, there are, you know, mainstream books, but like this is a very popular niche of books. And, you know, you don't get that many um, authors at 12 years old who are developing this passion already. So mm -hmm. thankfully, you did not change your genre because we yeah. get amazing books like The Laughing Policeman. And I also can't wait to read your other books. Um, okay, so I'm not sure I understand this question because I feel like there's a language difference um, between America and the UK. So maybe you can explain what the question means. Um, this is from James Seymour. He asks, pantser or plotter? Uh -huh. So um, a pantser is um, essentially when you're writing the book and you're kind of making it up as you go along. So it's by the seat of your pants. And oh, a pantser gotcha. is when you outline the book first. And I am most definitely a plotter. I The, the outline for The Laughing Policeman was 22,000 words just on the outline. Um, basically so, the book. <laughs> basically like a good chunk of the book. I mean, a few more thousand words and that could have been a novella in itself <laughs> so what I'd started doing with it was writing out a sentence for a chapter expanding on it writing questions that I wanted to and I did that for the whole book I didn't necessarily stick to everything but that's what I did and I outlined the foundling as well and when it came to the fractured few I thought do you know what I've written a book now I've written a novella I know what I'm doing. I don't need to do a massive outline anymore. It's fine. Got about halfway through and got stuck and had oh. to go back, outline it properly and start again. So at least I definitely know that I am a plotter now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I would be the same way because I would just get so far and then like fall into like 19 different plot holes and be like, how do I get myself out of this? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it's, You get to a certain point in the book and you think, right now, what am I supposed to do? So yeah, definitely, definitely a plotter. And I think I will always be a plotter just because I need to know where I'm going. It's sort of, I like to think of it as a map, as long as I know where I've got to end up I can get there and I might not necessarily go the planned route but I'll get there in the end yeah 
and, and you definitely did, so. All right, um, so this is also from James Seymour. He says, where do you get your ideas from? Um, everywhere, really. So the idea behind The Laughing Policeman was that I was on maternity leave and we've got um, one of those electronic devices that listens in to what you're saying. And um, I used to ask her to play uh, children's songs because obviously I had my son who was quite young and it was music supposed to be stimulating everything so it would play twinkle twinkle little star bar bar black sheep all of the things that you would expect to be children's and nursery rhymes and then all of a sudden it would randomly play the laughing policeman by charles penrose and i don't know whether you've heard that song i haven't heard of it now <laughs> you should google it when um when we get off here it's yeah the laugh it is freaky and there is a laugh and that laugh is freaky as well and the lyrics are just odd it's about a policeman who just laughs when he's arresting people he <laughs> laughs um there was one line about um he laughed until somebody was dead there was one about he laughed until his jaw cracked and I thought do you know what this is this is just a bit weird why would a policeman be like that and it all stemmed from there what would happen to this policeman to make him laugh all the time and what's wrong with him and that sort of thing so it sort of bloomed from there and yeah it's just things I might hear things I might see things on the news just anything that I think oh that's interesting and then it sort of stems off into some random thought process that ends up in a maybe book idea uh, so do you like keep like a journal of like if you just hear something random and you're like oh you know that'd be a good element and like you don't you have no idea where it would go but you write it down anyway because you know that it someday will go somewhere I do sometimes I do I have so being somebody who likes books I have about 200,000 notebooks I have drawers <laughs> of notebooks and I'm one of those people, oh, that's a nice notebook. That's not a writing in notebook. That's a special notebook. But I decided I would start using some of these notebooks. So it was a notebook for each idea because that notebook was going to be dedicated to this. So around the house, there are just notebooks with little <laughs> scribbles everywhere. So some of them I do jot down, but I'll have to find them in the pile of notebooks around the house. And other ones I think that I will remember. And some of them, are still inside my head and part of me thinks well if it's a good idea it'll stay in my head but we will see <laughs> that's impressive for you to rely on your memory because I know for a fact that it will not stay in my head like the better the idea the less likely it is that I'll remember it <laughs> oh yeah some things like I cannot remember what I ate yesterday or I can't remember what I walked into the room for but I sort of let them sit and I think if they're good enough I'll keep coming back to them and if I keep coming back to them I might jot it down yeah <laughs> I love that notebook I have notebooks everywhere too but I haven't I haven't I, I have like seven of them like sitting here on my desk as we speak <laughs> maybe I should use them for something probably not though yeah, um, how pretty they are they're not nope um yeah. Uh, this question is from MJ Mars, who is lovely. So um, I did an interview with her. She wrote a great book called The Suffering. Um, she is just so lovely. Um, she asks, I feel there are some fantasy elements to The Laughing Policeman. Do you ever write other genres or do you slash will you always stick with horror? Um, so although I love horror and as a child, all I wrote was horror. I don't really read or I didn't used to read that much horror. I read mainly fantasy. I would watch horror, and I'm not sure why, but a lot of the books I read, and I, you might be able to see behind me, mm -hmm. yeah. so those ones, they're all Brandon Sanderson books. You've got Terry Pratchett books. You've got um, load, loads, pretty much all fantasy. All the horror ones are in there they're just at the back so um I think because I read so much fantasy it's sort of ingrained and I love all the fantasy elements so um that's probably why it filters into the writing and I could potentially see myself writing fantasy but it would be darker sort of fantasy so if you think Joe Abercrombie sort of grim dark fantasy so 
here possibly, but I would like to finish this series before I start on something else. And I would also, I've got some ideas brewing for some more sort of mainstream horror books as well that are maybe less oh. fantasy and more horror. But yeah, I want to want to try and stick to one before I get distracted by everything else. Yeah, it's easy to get like a hundred different ideas and be like, ooh, it's shiny. Like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we have other questions coming up that are similar. I would like to actually, I'm just going to skip right ahead, um, to that question because I feel like it's a good, um, it's a good segue. So, um, so you do have a new book coming out, um, which is a sequel to The Laughing Policeman. Um, and you mentioned also that you want to finish the series. So can you talk about your new book and then also kind of tell us what's in the works, um, so what's in the works is a question that somebody asked. I just can't so find it who asked it. In in the works, obviously I want to finish the rest of the Brimstone Chorus series, which is um so the new book is the one that released yesterday, which is The Fractured Few. Um I would like to finish off that, but that series also ties in with the founding series, which will be a series of novellas. And I also want to write, just to make things easy on myself a sister series where its main character is one of the minor characters that was mentioned in The Laughing Policeman. Oh. So I sort of want to write three series all at the same time and I want them to all interweave. So the book for the sister series that I'm planning to write is supposed to happen in parallel with the book that's just been released, which is The Fractured Few, and then the Foundling series that's set in 1758. But it's going to come forward and eventually tie in to the rest of the series as well. So all of those things are in the works for now, and I'm going to try and not think about anything else until I at least have a handle on those. That's really impressive. Like you talk about being a planner, like in order to have three different series, like all interconnected, like you, you have to have like a, a very specific kind of brain to be able to keep all of that kind of in the air and, and going at the same time. So um, that's very I, impressive. I think I'm going to start needing a um, spreadsheet at some point. <laughs> I've got oh, the a... fact that you don't have a spreadsheet already that that yeah, no. <laughs> this is still all in my head at the moment. So I really should put it down on paper before I start forgetting things. I have this giant cork board next to me that I've been meaning to fix to the wall so that I can start putting post-its and things. You know, those things you see in the um, crime films where they've got the big, with all the little pieces of string. Yeah, I'm gonna need one of those, I think, eventually. That's amazing. That is amazing. I, I would love to see that. Once you put the board up, can you take a picture and just send it to me? Because I <laughs> just love to see that. <laughs> I'd need to stick a few things on it first. A uh, blank board would be a bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the board that has nothing on it. Great. <laughs> um, oh, so that question, what are you working on at the moment? That came from Brianna Rain. So she is also another lovely author. We did an interview with her as well. Um, so check out her books. The um, oh, she has a new book that came out recently. I can't remember the name of it, but I can't wait to read it. It's um, The Girls of Eden, Old yeah, Eden the, Street, or something like girl, that. Girls of Old Eden. I see. My brain's gone blank as well. I have it coming in the post. So um, <laughs> Brianna has sent me a assigned copy, which is very kind of her. Oh, that's Brianna amazing. And MJ are both really lovely as well yes yeah like I, I I am big fans of all of them and I know that the, the three of you all support each other a lot which it's important to do that you know especially female authors in horror because that's kind of a tough genre for for women to to you know build themselves up so I just mm. love this like friendship and camaraderie that you guys all have we're actually trying to um because I live not far from Brianna um she's about half an hour away Oh wow! We discovered, and we're trying to organise a UK-based event so that we can meet some of our fellow indie horror authors as well. And um, so yeah, I think it's MJ, me, Brianna, we're Jim Oddy, ML Rayner. Um, I think Rick Wood is going as well, and there's a handful of others that I've. Uh, Paulina, I think, is trying to 
come down as well. But um, it's amazing. Yeah. So if we get a venue sorted and everything, I will let you know. I would then- love to go. Like I, I know this is like for UK people. For me to go, it would be very difficult. But I would absolutely drop everything because these are all like people I've read most. Most of you, I've read books from and love, and I, um, I just wish that I lived closer to you guys. <laughs> oh, I think we're kind of jealous because you seem to have all the great horror cons in America, and we we have well, a few in the UK, but we don't have loads. And the ones we do have are all sort of up further up the country, and Vienna yeah. and I are down almost at the bottom. So um, I think that's one of the reasons why we're trying to organise something. Plus, it's going to be really great to meet everybody that we're interacting with in the books of horror indie group and be nice to put some faces to names I know I I would I would love to so I live in the northeast and all of our author cons are like down south so like that would be difficult for us so I can't go to those either so um I have in my head I'm like oh maybe we should do like a New England um meetup or something so that would be cool but um I know that's for I guess another video (laughs) for another time (laughs) um so you mentioned um, M.L. Rayner. Oh my gosh, we only have 10 minutes. Oh boy, we have 10 minutes and lots of questions. Okay, me so let's, Oh, it's me too. Like I do that too. So um, you mentioned M.L. Rayner. So I'm going to skip to his question, which I don't really understand either. So plain wagon wheels or gym? Yeah, so Matt knows that I do not eat wagon wheels. I have told Matt <laughs> that I do not eat wagon wheels. Um we are in a few other groups together a lot of the uk based authors we have some other author groups and what tends to happen is somebody will ask a very sensible question and they would like a very sensible response so it might be something about if we're organizing the venue are there any updates on the venue and this one simple question will descend into absolute chaos usually between matt jim paulina Brianna and myself and um it just it it goes off the rails and usually it ends up being I don't want to say smutty but Matt's involved so you know and um if you don't if you don't know what I'm talking about I got a signed book from Matt and this is what Matt includes in his signed oh, book <laughs> <laughs> I saw that I'm like my eyes <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine so um yeah so one of these conversations descended into anarchy as you would expect with a <laughs> lot together and it ended up with talks of skinny dipping and wagon wheels and I tried to point out I think he said this was a dream uh, no this was something he'd seen happen and I pointed out to him that it must just be a dream because I do not eat wagon wheels and <laughs> Paulina also does not eat wagon wheels and um he's convinced he's adamant so um I think I might send him some wagon wheels through the post I have <laughs> to do something to get revenge because I don't know whether you saw I put a post up in the books of horror group about this book mm-hmm. that Matt sent me because he booby trapped the parcel with about a ton of glitter oh, and God. there's still oh. glitter that falls out of this book every time I pick it up and I went to get something that I dropped behind my filing cabinet the other day. And there is a ton of glitter that I hadn't managed to get with the Hoover. So, um, yeah. So you're going to have glitter in your house basically for the rest of your life. And you're yeah, never for the rest get of my life. <laughs> it is, people, people keep saying that glitter is the um, herpes of the crafting world. So, um, yeah. So no wagon wheels. But I think oh, I might no. send him some wagon wheels. And glitter next time I send him a signed book. <laughs> no, just forget the wagon, just the glitter, I feel just like. <laughs> Maybe if I could somehow insert the glitter into the wagon wheel packet so that when he opens it. I hope he doesn't, he's not going to watch this for sure. So, so yeah, you should definitely, he won't watch this. So he won't know that this is coming. I think that's a, I, a great idea. I think people should send us other revenge, glitter revenge based ideas so that maybe I can put some of them into fruition that's it okay so so whoever's watching this please come up with awful awful ideas specifically for ml rayner because we know what a dick he is now he's not, he seems like a lovely person <laughs> so he is a lo- what- he's in real i say in real life he's a lovely person just don't don't mention glitter and you should be fine 
don't mention glitter and like if he sends you something don't look at it because you will be scarred for life <laughs> yeah just i think as long as you prepare yourself for the signed packages you should be fine <laughs> that's hilarious okay um so this question is from uh ben young do you listen to music while you write and if so what kinds so I don't because I am very easily distracted. And if I'm listening to music while I'm trying to write, I will start listening to the music instead, stop writing, start listening to the lyrics. Then start I'll go dancing. down, a, start dancing, go down a rabbit hole of, oh, that song's reminded me of this song or this band. Now I'm going to try and look for that song and that band. And before I know it, the day's gone and I've been listening to music all day. So if I were to listen to music, it would have to be something with, no words in it so that I couldn't actually pay too much attention so music, yeah. I do a lot of stuff pretty much in silence which I know is boring but it means I can get something done yeah I mean if you can only listen to your brain like with the silence I feel like that makes sense um so this question is from Christine Praise she asks what do you believe is the hardest part about writing Definitely writing. The writing part. <laughs> the writing. So, <laughs> even though I can do all of these outlines, and outlining is fine because you can just say, oh, well, I want something like this to happen, and then this needs to happen. And you can have a huge outline. And then when you go to write it, you need more than just those words. And I'm one of those people, I like it to be perfect, and you can't get it perfect and get it finished. So when I did The Laughing Policeman, I think, it took maybe a year and a half because I wasn't writing for any time frame. I didn't have any deadlines. It was just for me. And I would write and I would rewrite and I would rewrite paragraphs several times. And now, obviously, to try and get things out more consistently, I just got to get through the draft. So I think the hardest part is, one, the writing, and two, trying just to finish the draft before you go back and do any edits because... Yeah obviously you've got you you could spend forever trying to get a perfect first paragraph or first chapter or even a first sentence and you just need to move on with it so yeah writing and um getting it finished I think I can see that I um we don't have a ton of time so I would like to like talk more about this but um maybe we can take it offline because I would like to pick your brain on that later um uh so this is Liz Hargrove. What is your favorite cake? Anything. I will eat any sort of cake. Um, chocolate cake I like. Carrot cake. Basically, if it's a cake, it's fine <laughs> by me. In fact, if you if you go to my any of my author pages on any of my social media platforms, you will not be able to scroll through without seeing at least a few pictures of cake. In fact, I bought myself yesterday because it was release day a celebratory chocolate fudge cake. So there is cake mm. downstairs, which I probably will also take a photo of because um, who doesn't like seeing photos of cake? Yeah. But anything, as long as it's not a low fat cake. There's almost- Oh yeah, no, why? No That's point. the purpose of cake. I mean, <laughs> that, that is flavor. <laughs> I agree. Um, this is from Elizabeth Asbury. Um, this is like a two-part question. Do you feel there are some horror tropes or subgenres that are more popular in the UK than other countries? And are there any horror writers that are super popular in the UK that you'd love to see have recognition worldwide? Um, I, I don't know, to be honest. I think because we get so much, I mean, most of our films come from America. Most of our series come from America. So everything that's big in America is usually big over here as well. I mean, the, if you say horror author to anybody in the UK, they're probably going to come back to you and say Stephen King or Dean Koontz. I mean, we do have a few horror authors, but I don't, I think they're equally as widely known in the US as they are in the UK. So we've got Clive Barker, who um, his books, obviously you had the Hellraiser, franchise from Ramsey Campbell James Herbert but I think they are all known in the U.S. as well so I can't <laughs> specifically think of anybody who's huge over here that you wouldn't have heard of yeah and um the second part see 
I'm so scared. I, um, I can't remember. Actually, if you don't mind, I, I sorry to interrupt you. We actually only have, we're going to get kicked out of here in one minute exactly. So um, instead of answering the rest of that question, um, we there are so many questions that we didn't answer. Would you mind um, if you go through the questions in the original Q&A post, would you mind just like typing out an answer to everything that we didn't get to? Um, I honestly didn't think that we... Um, wouldn't get through these. So this has been an amazing conversation. You are so funny. I hope everybody watches this and, and gets to see what a great personality you have. Um, and I hope everybody reads this um, and the series because I, I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend. It has a little bit of everything. Um, I love that, you know, this is a demon with a personality. <laughs> you know, you get a lot of things that you don't get in a lot of different books. Um, and so thank you so much for joining me. And thank you for having me. Yeah. I am. Um, congratulations on your new book. I can't wait to read it. Um, and we're going to get kicked out probably in two seconds. So <laughs> we're just going to say goodbye. No way. <laughs> All thank right. you. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.